us record quickly. Um, first, I want to welcome all of you all to the first in our series of North Carolina's National Radon Action Month webinar series. My name is Sarah Kirby. I'm a professor in the Department of Agricultural and Human Sciences at NC State University. I'm also an assistant director of the North Carolina State Extension. Um, our organization is serving as sort of the platform and technical host of this series. Um, and before I turn it over to your real host and to our speakers, there are a couple of things that I, I wanted to share with you. First, we are recording this session so it can be viewed later. Um, and um, Philip Gibson will be giving more information about that in the future. Um, also, I have muted everyone's microphones except for the speakers, and that's just so that we can minimize the amount of distraction that um, is out there that sometimes occurs when we're sitting in our offices. And then third, um, we ask that you go ahead and put questions that you might have into the chat box. Um, Dr. Salmon has said that he is willing to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the session, but it's likely that we might not be able to reach all of those uh, questions or answer all of those questions in the time that we have. And so we'll put together a document with those questions and the answers to those and send those out to our program participants after the session. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Philip Gibson, who is with the North Carolina Radon Program. And he um, is really the, the brainchild behind all of this. So Philip, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. I wanted to also just take a moment before I introduce Dr. Samet uh, and thank those who have helped us reach each of you who are now participating uh, as, uh, as participants really for this webinar and the webinars to come up later on this month. So this slide represents, and you have seen these uh, logos in the announcements um, that have been distributed globally and I'm very thankful for these partners and just want to make note of that. Uh, we do have roughly 300 uh, participants registered for this event and we're closing in on that number for the three that are taking place later this month. Um, I want to note that there are a number of people, a great percentage of people that stated that they have never tested their home for radon and that was from one of the registration questions that we posed to registrants. If you have not tested your home for radon, there is an opportunity for you to gain a free radon test kit. And not only is our state providing free radon test kits at ncradon.org, but most every other state across the country is participating in National Radon Action Month in the same manner. So um, I, I encourage you to take an opportunity to or take the opportunity to go get a free radon test kit and test your home for radon so that you know at least what you're being exposed to. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, uh, Sarah, for me, please. And I now wanna take a moment to introduce Dr. Jonathan Samet. It is a tremendous honor to have all four of these individuals presenting this month. It is extremely um, a great honor to actually introduce jo uh, Jonathan Samet, Dr. Samet. He's a pulmonary physician, an epidemiologist, and is the dean of the school, um, the Colorado School of Public Health. His degrees are in chemistry and physics from Harvard College. His medical degree is from the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. And he holds a master's of science degree in epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Samet has served and chaired numerous committees uh, of the National Research Council and the Institute of Medicine. Among others, Dr. Samet has chaired the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee for the US EPA and the FDA's Tobacco Products Scientific Advisory Committee. For the National Research Council, he chaired, among others, the biological effects of ionizing radiation, uh, often known as beer, uh, the beer report that uh, many of us uh, refer back to, those of us within uh, the radon world. And he also served on the Committee on Research Priorities for Airborne Particulate Matter with the Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology. So Dr. Samet's research focuses on the health risks of inhaled pollutants, particles in ozone and outdoor air, and indoor pollutants such as or including radon. 
Thank you, Dr. Samet, for participating in this National Radon webinar series. We are truly grateful for your time. Great. Um, so, good morning, everybody, and uh, I'm delighted to uh, have this opportunity to uh, speak with you about radon. It's uh, it's interesting. I've been involved with this uh, a long time, as you will as you will uh, learn. And the radon story has been sort of uh, for me, relatively quiet in part, uh, I think year six uh, that Philip mentioned uh, was released in 1998, quite a while uh, back now. So uh, let's get on with this. So just to give you a feel for sort of what's going on on the research side, this is just the results of a very simple literature search saying how many papers a year are being published that are about radon and lung cancer. You, so you can see we're still doing science on this, although uh, if you go back into the late 80s uh, and early 90s, there was a lot of uh, work funded because there were so many uncertainties about uh, the radon and lung cancer problem, and particularly what were the risks. Uh, a great deal of controversy, and controversy, of course, about the, uh, the proposal that all homes in the U.S. essentially should be uh, tested. Uh, I became involved in this uh, story when I began my academic career in New Mexico in 1978. That was a point at which the uranium industry was booming in, in the state, which had become the largest producer of uranium in the United States, really in the Western countries. And um, the industry was projected to a possibly triple in size, going from 5,000 underground miners to 15,000. Um, 1978, of course, was also Three Mile Island. And from that event and the cancellation of many nuclear power plants, the industry, uh, the uranium industry began to uh, decline. And in fact, just yesterday, a friend sent me uh, a story about the Gulf, what was the Gulf Mount Taylor, very deep mine uh, closing. So here's some, uh, pictures uh, back to those uh, days. Uh, uranium mining uh, was uh, in New Mexico, moved there, particularly after the uh, Colorado Plateau where it surged. Um, initially, uh, there was mining out to the northwest part of the state, but then I'll show you pictures of uh, Ambrosia Lake, uh, New Mexico, that area where the industry uh, really grew. It was a colorful industry and uh, had many uh, well-known characters um, in it, such as uh, Charlie Steen, who was uh, developed mines uh, on the uh, Colorado Plateau. This is just a shot of the Uranium Cafe in Grants, uh, New Mexico. This is the Jack Pile Mine uh, near Laguna Pueblo, probably 60 miles approximately west of uh, Albuquerque. You can just get a feel for the scope uh, of the mine. This is now all uh, reclaimed. Now this is me a long time ago, about to go um, underground uh, at Ambrosia Lake uh, near, uh, near Grants. You can notice that uh, it says no smoking underground, something that was not strictly uh, adhered to as you can uh, imagine. This uh, is a view of uh, what looks like uh, underground, uh, the so-called stope, uh, where the miners are actively uh, working. And again, here's the cage uh, going underground. This is a view of Ambrosia Lake, not much of a lake as you can see. Off in the distance, uh, Mount Taylor, uh, a very large tailings pile, which you can see. And then right in front of you is a ventilation shaft bringing outdoor clean, if you will, low radon air down into the uh, mine. And in the mine, the air with low radon is being here uh, carried out in, the, in this tube to the stope, the area where the miner is actually uh, working. And the goal was to use ventilation to reduce the radon uh, concentrations inhaled by the miners. This is the, uh, an area where miners are actively working, a uh, stope, and the radon here comes out of the rock, diffuses out of the rock, just as it would out of the soil under a home, 
and into the um, and into the air. This is the final product. This is at a, a uranium mill. This is yellow cake uh, U308, and this would then be at the time uh, shipped off uh, elsewhere for further uh, processing, whether for fuel rods uh, or other uh, activities. It, around the kinds of problems that were experienced with the um, industry, there were worker health issues, there were general environmental uh, issues. The tailings piles at, at the time we began our work there were not stabilized. Of course, they later were under the uranium mill tailings recovery act or UMTRA, but here's a view on uh, a windy day and you can see uh, dust blowing up here from uh, a tailings pile. There are other environmental problems. There's a well-known uh, spill uh, from church rock uh, from the tailings pond uh, contaminating the uh, Rio Puerco uh, in uh, New Mexico with implications for the uh, tribal lands and for uh, agriculture and uh, hunting. And then the uh, social problems that came with the industry. This is a drive up a uh, liquor store right out at Ambrosia Lake. Uh, Jay's Liquors welcomes you to uranium country and the miners would stop there uh, as they left the mines for a long drive off and back to Albuquerque and pick up uh, beer for the uh, ride. One uh, early study we did uh, looked at the problem of lung cancer in the Navajo. Uh, the Navajo males were largely non-smokers, and we did a very simple study published in 1984, where we used our tumor registry, where we tracked all cancers in the uh, Navajo. We had uh, 32 cases total, a uh, small number because there was no smoking, but essentially the majority of the cases were in men who had mined uranium. This was a so-called case control study. Here we're just showing the locations of where the cases were. If they were, the dark circles indicate um, uranium miners, and they were all clustered up in the corner of the state where there had been mining at very high levels of uh, exposure in the 1950s. Essentially, it turned out in this non-smoking group, the majority of cases were directly attributable to uh, uranium mining, and this, of course, had later implications for uh, compensation. So I'm gonna sort of look back and, um, and look forward uh, in the time that we're here together. If you go back historically, uh, the story of problems of lung disease in radon exposed miners go back um, centuries. There was this disease, Birkenkrite, uh, in miners in the Carpathian Mountains. This is in uh, Eastern Europe and this, same uh, areas where radon was later linked to uh, lung cancer. So here is a shot of uh, Agricola. And uh, he commented, in fact, on the fact that many women had multiple husbands because they died so young. This goes back a little bit to the Navajo story. Uh, we had uh, in our series uh, individuals as young as early 30s with uh, lung cancer. They began mining as teenagers and had very high exposure levels. And within 15 to 20 years, the uh, lung cancer uh, showed uh, up. So here's this uh, quotation from uh, Agricola. And then as we move forward in the late 19th century, uh, Harding and Hesse described the fact that lung miners in this region developed a uh, thoracic uh, malignancy uh, later confirmed to be uh, lung cancer. And here's their uh, original paper, 1879. These miners uh, were uh, here on the German side of the uh, Carpathian or Ertz Mountains. Later, uh, as I'll show you, the same lung cancer problem was identified in miners on the uh, other side. And radon was found to be uh, at high levels in, uh, in these mountains uh, in the 1920s, this report from Ludwig and uh, Lorenzo. So we, soon uh, by the early part of the 20th century, we had confirmed lung cancer problem uh, in this side of the mountain range on the Czech side in uh, Yakimov. And uh, 
you know, this a, a lot of historical questioning about when sort of the case was proven that uh, radon caused lung cancer, but somewhere in the uh, 30s and 40s, you'll find writings suggesting this to be the uh, case. Now, in the United States, we began mining um, uranium in the Colorado Plateau region in the late uh, 1940s. It was recognized, of course, that there was radon uh, in these mines early, uh, early on. And the response on the part of the Public Health Service was to begin a still ongoing epidemiological study of uh, miners in the uh, Colorado Plateau. As a historical note, in 1951, the dosimetry of radon and radon progeny was worked on, and it was recognized that the radioactivity that was causing the, uh, the high dose to the lung came not from radon, but from uh, radon progeny, radon daughters, and in particularly the uh, polonium-218 and polonium-214, which uh, underwent decay with release of uh, alpha particles, highly damaging to biological uh, tissues. Uh, the industry boomed in uh, the Colorado Plateau, the Four Corners region. Uh, I already mentioned uh, Charlie Steen, who was a uh, part of this amazing boom and uh, bust uh, story. I think everyone knows that people prospected vigorously uh, for um, uranium, of course, with the hope of uh, becoming rich. Now, by, by the late 1950s and early 1960s, it was clear that there was a, a lung cancer problem emerging among the miners in the uh, Colorado uh, Plateau, and there were actually a series of meetings of the uh, regional governors to, uh, to address this as more and more people became uh, involved in the uh, industry. Of course, a legacy of this is the uh, burden of lung cancer still, still sustained by the uh, former uh, miners, and I'll come back to that. This is a, uh, a, a touching piece published uh, in the uh, New Yorker about uh, the widows uh, and uh, who in some cases had quite difficult times uh, obtaining uh, compensation. That's a, that's a complicated story that I'll leave out, but just point out that one important consequence of the um, industry has been an epidemic of uh, lung cancer and other problem and the problems in the form of uranium miners and millers Looking forward, there were more cohorts uh, of miners, including one we established looking at the New Mexico uranium miners, where there was a fourfold excess of lung cancer. In the United States, radon, <coughs> concern about indoor radon really mounted uh, rapidly after the identification of the watcher's home and all the publicity uh, about the home. Actually, measurements of indoor radon in homes that had been made in the early 1950s in uh, Sweden, and the problem was uh, recognized. In terms of understanding uh, the risks, the uh, biological effects of ionizing radiation report number four uh, took on developing uh, risk models for uh, radon. Uh, I led that uh, effort for beer four, and then in beer six, uh, we, in 1998, as I mentioned, Philip mentioned, we moved on to uh, develop risk models that are essentially still uh, in use, epidemiologically uh, based. By, as these reports were done, there was an ever-growing uh, set of epidemiological studies, uh, some uh, I'm running through here, on uh, the risk of lung cancer in radon-exposed uh, minors. So here's some of those, and I'll give you an update on that, um, on that story. So uh, then, of course, we have the uh, watcher's home, uh, the initial measurements of radon in homes in the US, the finding that, of course, radon was ubiquitous, and that some homes could uh, have, in fact, quite high levels, bringing this question of uh, what to do, how to identify those homes and what to, <clears throat> what to do about them. Here is the uh, Beer 4 uh, report. 
with a model for risk of radon based on uh, three studies of underground miners. And then with uh, BEER-6, we used uh, data from 11 different studies, pulled the data together, and analyzed it to develop uh, the risk models that lead to such things as radon as the second leading cause of lung cancer in the United States, and provided that uh, quantification. In 1989, with uh, Tony Nero, who was one of the leaders in looking at the indoor radon problem, we published a review in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. And it's just sort of interesting to go back and look at this uh, more than 30 years later. Of course, the advisory that most homes should be tested had been incredibly controversial. Uh, we said uh, that even though there were different analyses of the risk, there was a rationale for action um, and then commented on the you know the four picocuries per liter the 150 becquerel per cubic meter guideline level and just commented that this did not draw a boundary between what was safe um, and unsafe and by then i think we were beginning to understand that there was no threshold of exposure below which there was uh, no risk and you can see that here we comment it's evidently indoor radon, a long-standing environmental health uh, problem, and the usual call for more uh, research. Of course, a lot of communications was going on to tell the world about uh, the dangers. Um, radon cartoons are nothing, just sitting around worrying about radon. Famous um, uh, piece for communicating from, uh, this is from the National Ad Council, it's free advertising, it became very controversial because of the equating of uh, the radon risk to uh, chest uh, x-ray, but I think the, the campaign was looking for a, a radiation exposure that people uh, understood. So here's what uh, BEER-4 did. It developed these risk models, I'm sorry, I misspoke before, based on four studies of uh, underground miners and developed uh, tables projecting the um, risks. Now this was done with a much larger data set uh, when we did the BEER-6 uh, report. These were immense efforts uh, involving, in the case of BEER-6, uh, an initial planning phase and then four years of work, so sort of from start to finish about uh, six years. At the heart of it was this pooled analysis of studies from underground miners these are the uh, principal investigators and our NCI, National Cancer Institute, colleagues at a, a meeting we had where we planned the uh, pooling uh, work in the early 1990s. And that led to a publication in 1994 uh, with the National Cancer Institute that provided uh, a picture like this. So this is the extra risk of lung cancer, ERR per WLM working level month, for the different cohorts, the point estimate and the confidence intervals, and then we pooled all the data. And this kind of pooled risk estimate is what is then used to do the projections on risk across the lifetime living at different levels of radon uh, exposure. This uh, shows the model developed for by beer 6 Main point here is that the risk depended on uh, what age one reached and how long it had been since uh, exposure ended and what was the rate of uh, exposure. Uh, we looked at lower dose exposure uh, in these miners. And I think a, a point I'd like to make here is that uh, as we go down lower and lower, you can see that more or less there's a linear relationship between uh, risk and uh, exposure. And this makes sense on a biological basis because the energy delivered by one of these alpha particles to hit is simply a property of nature. It doesn't depend on the exposure. So at low dose or high dose, uh, the energy delivered to a cell is the same. It's just the number of hits that goes up as exposure goes up. I will let you know that there is a new pooling effort uh, of putting together the studies of underground uranium miners under, uh, underway. It includes a number of new uh, cohorts and I think will provide useful uh, next uh, further information around 
what these risks uh, look like, uh, but you'll have to stay tuned uh, a little bit uh, for that. One of the issues, of course, is um, given that smoking is uh, a dominant cause of lung cancer, what about the combination of smoking and uh, radon exposure? A bit, a bit complicated, but um, to, to summarize, there is synergy. That is, for those who smoke, there's additional risk beyond what would you, you would expect from simply adding radon plus smoking um, together. And I, you know, one, one way to reduce lung cancer is to reduce smoking. One way is to reduce radon. And if you reduce smoking, it helps with some of the uh, radon uh, contribution. So going back to the, uh, then the question of indoor radon, here's a picture of the uh, watchersome from Time Magazine. I, I think first off, um, the uh, question of is this an important problem? The answer is yes, this is from beer six. This is the percentage of uh, lung cancer attributable to radon in male and females and males overall in smokers and in non-smokers. And we've shown the percent. And also now this, this is an old calculation, of course, when there are different numbers of lung cancer cases, fewer of the number of um, attributable uh, cases. These numbers of attributable cases are based on the idea of comparing the numbers under radon exposures as they are to a hypothetical where in fact indoor levels are lowered to what they are uh, outdoors, not, not necessarily uh, achievable. So, you know, with a number in around 20,000, uh, radon is an important cause of cancer generally and of lung cancer in uh, particular. So going back to what I've said, uh, this uh, gets at the percentage of homes that have a level lower than whatever the figure is. So here's our four picocuries uh, per liter uh, EPA guideline value. Here are the homes with really high levels. It, the number, the 20,000 or whatever number you want for the total number of lung cancer cases attributable comes to lowering the radon level indoors, essentially to background levels, what they are outdoors. We're not gonna get there if we want homes with uh, walls, of course. Uh, so what, what you'll notice is that if we lower things, lower concentrations, let's say at four and cut off things here, which is what we hope to achieve, there's still a substantial number of homes, the majority where radon exposure continues. So we can't prevent all the radon attributable cases. Of course, one thing we do want to do is go after the tail of the distribution here where are, there are these very high um, levels in uh, some cases. So here's uh, attributable and then what is uh, achievable or targeted. So in reality, what we'd like to do is shift this whole cut off the high homes and shift this distribution over to the uh, left as as much as is um, possible. Here's some old numbers uh, from EPA, uh, 21,000 lung cancer deaths a year. You heard the news lately, you heard uh, today, uh, in fact, you heard the recent report uh, that lung cancer mortality, uh, the number of deaths uh, dropped uh, notably uh, this, uh, this year, perhaps some of that uh, represents a, an effect of efforts to control radon, but certainly smoking uh, figures in, and then some uh, advances in diagnosis and therapy for uh, lung cancer. Uh, globally, uh, radon is a uh, cause of cancer. We have some estimates of what the cancer burden is uh, globally uh, made by the Global Burden of Disease uh, Project. And, and of course, you're all uh, familiar with uh, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency's efforts to provide background and guidance on uh, indoor radon. I know the states have developed uh, materials. I will say going back uh, to the mid 80s, uh, many of us worked with EPA uh, over the 
the mid 80s into the 1990s uh, as these communications materials were developed, uh, trying to build from the foundation that the beer committees and others were uh, providing. So uh, it's interesting if you look, there's variation in action levels uh, around, uh, around the world. It, you know, again, I, I think what's remarkable about uh, radon when I talk to people about why test, how many uh, environmental carcinogens are there for which we can cheaply do tests uh, on our own and where mitigation is possible um, and uh, affordable. And then uh, research in progress, this uh, updating uh, I already mentioned is uh, under underway. I think it's again, probably a couple of years until we see any new risk models coming from this. With our new molecular tools, we've been making comparisons of molecular changes in lung cancers uh, that may be linked to radon compared with those linked to other uh, agents. And of course, there's you know your efforts and those of the research community uh, in part to, to try and look at uh, how to uh, get people engaged in uh, testing. And I, I think I'm ending here with um, just uh, a series of all the recent radon uh, cartoons that we could uh, uh, find, and they still exist. So uh, here, we, uh, here we are. So uh, I think this is where I've come to a uh, close, and you know, happy to stay on for a few minutes uh, to answer questions if uh, that's what the moderators want to do. So thanks for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. There are a couple of questions that um, have come through. Um, they may be best answered by Philip. I'm not sure. The first one that we've received is um, that many realtors in Florida believe there's not radon in Florida. And what media can be shared to, with them? Um, or better yet, is there a seminar or, um, or materials that can be used for their weekly or monthly meetings? I think we have that same problem in North Carolina. They think only the mountains are the areas where radon is, and we've discovered that radon is everywhere. So, Philip, I'll let you handle that. Sure. Um, so that was from Debbie. Debbie, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, the folks from the Florida Radon Program are participating in this uh, event as well. They're online. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, refer you mainly to them so that they can help you at the local level. Uh, but I will acknowledge that we are having uh, another series of webinars that will happen in February, of which we've asked uh, Jay Hyland from the Maine program, uh, the state of Maine that is, uh, program, radon program, to speak about their experiences with handling radon in water. Uh, and then we've asked Bill Broadhead to speak about uh, radon in building materials so that I know that in Florida, well, actually, in a number of states across the country, building materials, uh, radon or uranium within building materials are uh, the source or have been the source of elevated radon levels in those buildings. Um, so I will send you an email with uh, the Florida contacts, and uh, hopefully that'll, that'll help you. Yeah, and, and Rainey emphasizes the fact that uh, Florida can have high levels of radon because she indicates or, that there's a 300, there was a home that was tested with 300 picocuries uh, uh, per liter um, that was found. So it's, it's not impossible. Um, and then the second question um, was from, I uh, believe it was from Ron, um, and that's what's the best way to test private residential well water and what are the best means to remove radon from well water? Is an understanding that granular activated carbon um, water filters are an effective means and wanted to know if you had any comments related to that. Yeah, and again, I'll, I'll uh, send you an email specific to that, but to help other folks, um, Again, I'll reiterate that we're having Maine speak uh, twice, actually, in February at two different dates. And one of those will be focused on uh, mitigation and testing of radon or radionuclides in water. Um, GACs, or granulated activated charcoal systems, are one of a couple of uh, ways to, to actually manage uh, radionuclides or radon specifically in well water, private well water. Um, 
the, the thing that we're dealing with in North Carolina is in Wake County specifically is just that issue. So um, it's early for me to understand uh, exactly what is the silver bullet or if there is even a silver bullet. I don't think that there is. Um, so there's a couple of different strategies out there and we're pulling those together. In terms of testing, Wake County, uh, North Carolina, their groundwater program has a, a fantastic website. They've actually pulled together resources um, that I don't believe anyone else has pulled together uh, with regard to radon and water. Very good. That's all the questions that have, have come through on the chat box. So I will turn it over to you, Philip, to, to close and um, do an advertisement for our, our next session. Certainly. Well, again, Dr. Samet, thank you so much for presenting okay. today. It's truly an honor to have you here, uh, even virtually. <laughs> so um, noting all that you have done for this, uh, for the world in terms of particulates and radon and actually improving people's lives. So thank you. Our next presentation that's coming up next week actually is Dr. William Field, or he likes to be referred to as Bill, Bill Field. Uh, from the Iowa, uh, University of Iowa there, and he has been a stalwart or a, a significant resource to state, federal, uh, international radon programs, and he'll be speaking about the new guide that he actually uh, edited, authored uh, around guiding medical professionals on the subject matter of radon, uh, radon-induced lung cancer. So, my hope is that you'll participate uh, next week. There are still a few uh, spots available in registration, so uh, try to snatch those up as fast as you can. And um, uh, thank you again, Dr. Sama, and thank you also, Sarah, for your support. Uh, most folks don't know that the North Carolina Radon Program began with the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service at NC State University. So we're thankful for that history and that continued support. Absolutely. There is one more question if you want to try to answer it or address it. It's that they have a lot of imported radon from poured concrete slab from rocks up in the northern part of the country, um, as well as from granite countertops. And I don't know if you want to speak to that or not, just in closing. Um, in closing, so we've found, at least for North Carolina, that granite countertops are not a significant source of elevated radon levels in homes. However, building materials in general tend to be, uh, they have the potential, I could say, uh, to have that. The only way you'll know is by testing. The only way you'll know if you have an elevated radon level is by testing. Um, so not all building materials are subject to elevated uranium or radon levels. Um, but it's something that everyone should test for. So again, I'll make the last plug, which is that every state in the country uh, most likely is providing free radon test kits. Uh, I know that we are on our website at ncradon.org. So there was a great percentage of people uh, who have registered for these events that have not tested their home for radon. They do not know how to test. Please reach out to me and I'll help guide you. And can you share that radon and water site one last time? Yes, in fact, I'll email it out to everyone so that Perfect. you'll have a, um, a link directly to the Wake County website. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. We'll see you next week.